Okay, we're going to have a more informal session today because I'm unprepared. Um, we're going to go through Lumley, Clairbout, and Bevick's uh, anti-alias Kirchhoff 3D migration SEG expanded abstract. And this is the great thing about uh, SEG meetings and and really a lot of engineering meetings. You can go and watch a, uh, uh, an amazing presentation, which is uh, what I did. In uh, The SEG meeting was in Los Angeles that year. And you can get inspired. And, and then right there in your, uh, you know, I was carrying the, uh, the abstract volume. It wasn't, uh, it was only as big as, uh, as the Pasadena telephone book uh, that year, not as big as the as the uh, two-volume uh, Los Angeles telephone book that stands maybe about, uh, well, at the time it stood maybe eight inches high. Um, you know, now the, uh, the SEG uh, meeting has, um, you know, way too many presentations and they, they hand out the abstract volume on uh, uh, a memory stick or some similar sort of uh, uh, device. So um, not that there's that. There's probably twice as many papers uh, nowadays as there were at uh, um, in 1994 uh, per SEG meeting. Nowadays, uh, twice as many papers get submitted as uh, get accepted. But uh, I think in '94 it was. Um, uh, You'd have to you'd have to make a big mistake in your, you know, with your uh, expanded abstract to not get your your paper uh, accepted. Um, so it wasn't uh, it wasn't very uh, uh, competitive. So you go to these sessions and you don't know what you're going to hear. Uh, of course, uh, you know I saw Clairbout's name on uh, uh, among the list uh, for this session, and I I went and uh, it was a great session. And uh, Lumley's paper was the one that I still remember. Um, so having been inspired by it, uh, I just opened the uh, opened the um, the abstract volume, and there's all the equations. So pretty quickly after that, uh, well, it took me a few years, but after that, I was able to implement the um, anti-aliasing criteria within um, my own Kirchhoff migrations. So um, Lumley starts off by explaining three different kinds of, of aliasing. There's data aliasing, there's image aliasing, and there's operator aliasing. Um, and this old, uh, um, in 94, uh, submittals of the, uh, uh, of the SEG papers were done uh, uh, on hard copy, and um, I think pretty quickly after that they were all scanned and run through, um, you know, what were used to be expensive and difficult uh, early versions of uh, text recognition software. So uh, you can see that there are problems with, uh, you know, spacing and fonts and and characters that have been uh, unrecognized. Um, or, uh, uh, for instance, uh, throughout this paper, um, the uh, the A X should be delta X. Okay, so that's a uh, a delta X that the the text conversion uh, software thought it recognized as A X. You know, these were all done uh, at once by people, but not by the authors. Um, and it would be nice if they would allow the authors the, the term, the, the ability to copy correct uh, their old papers. I think a lot of authors would do it. <clears throat> but these are out in the, um, you know, they're all indexed now. Uh, you know, changing the, the archive now is just too much. So we have to, we have to use our knowledge to uh, read through that. All right. So we're talking about spatial aliasing here. And... Um, if you um, uh, 
if you're recording data on the on a planar surface like uh, uh, the Earth's surface, um, and you have uh, frequencies which are greater than this f sub d, which uh, Lumley is defining as the uh, um, uh, the apparent velocity, okay, v sub r in the direction of uh, wave propagation. That's what the r is. Uh, divided by uh, four, divided by sine of of uh, theta sub r, and divided by delta x. Okay, so um, <clears throat> you know basically what we're doing is we're taking um, uh, you know four and sine are unitless. Um, Velocity is meters per second. We're dividing by the meters of uh, delta x, and that's what is uh, giving us one over uh, one over uh, seconds, which is a frequency in hertz. So um, delta x, uh, which is uh, here as well, is the uh, trace spacing. Um, there's a uh, uh, velocity at the receiver location, and there's a local plane wave incident angle. I'm sorry, so that's not a that's a that's an interval velocity, not an apparent velocity. All right, so v, v sub r is velocity at the receiver. Uh, there's a local plane wave incidence angle uh, uh, theta sub r at the recording surface. Okay, and you know this is uh, you can think about this in 3D, right? Just have to know what your delta x is in in uh, in 3D. Um, so uh, whenever uh, you record those higher frequencies, and believe me, you always do, all right, uh, then um, it's uh, it's really impossible to uh, uh, get rid of the effects of aliasing without reshooting the uh, the original spacing. Okay, so that's a that's a very fundamental kind of aliasing, um, you know. Very much like uh, the same problem as time aliasing. All right. Now, uh, just looking at um, Joe's uh, uh, migrations, you can get uh, this image aliasing, which is uh, uh, just you know up, up near the surface. You know, there's this alias appearance of Joe's migrations, and by contrast, this is a, a, a much less serious um, problem. In fact, it's it's really entirely a cosmetic problem, and um, uh, it's uh, reflective of the ability of uh, the uh, Kirchhoff migrated values at each mesh point, and he means in the uh, um, uh, Lumley means in the um, in the cross section. You know that we would be looking at, say, at uh, one of Joe's cross sections. Okay, those. Um, you know, without any data aliasing um, or, or other aliasing that we'll discuss in a second, um, those, uh, those individual image points are uncontaminated and correct. Uh, just imagine, for instance, that we, were, that we were migrating into one single point right, in the, um, in the subsurface. We don't have a section. Uh, we don't even have a profile. We just have one point. That isolated point in the ground is totally spatially aliased. There is no frequency that is unaliased to uh, one point, um, because uh, by having one sample exactly, we're assuming that the value of that sample applies everywhere. You know, in in, in our in our image-like view of the world, and so, um, but. But we know that <clears throat> every one of those points is derived independently. So the, uh, the image aliasing is really just an appearance of aliasing. And if we don't like it, we can solve it perfectly. Uh, assuming no other aliasing, we can solve it perfectly by just producing another, another image <clears throat> that, is, um, uh, that is at a finer, uh, you know, finer delta x and delta z spacing, and maybe delta y as well. Okay, so so you know what Lumley says here. This is a what he calls a target-oriented capability of the Kirchhoff migration, um, and that's not 
possible with spectral or finite difference migration methods, right? They will alias <coughs> um, in and their their images, you know, even independently of, of all these other uh, all these other uh, uh, aliasing problems. So, um, you know, the 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 aliasing that we get in in you know spatial and time domain Kirchhoff uh, images, it's really only an aesthetic problem. And uh, it's easily solved. <clears throat> um, of course, it, it has its effects. You know, uh, a uh, spatially aliased uh, that spatially aliased junk at the top of uh, of our um, <clears throat> um, of our migrated sections, our Santa Medio migrated sections, make it impossible to um, um, make it impossible to. Um, you know, do an FK analysis, a, a proper FK analysis, especially because that junk is so high amplitude. So we really have to cut it out before, uh, you know, we we pass the uh, um, we pass the the migrated sections through, you know, certain other processing uh, uh, processing uh, uh, procedures. Uh, for instance, uh, I, I often apply uh, the Hale dip filter. To uh, migrated images, and up at the top, um, you know, there uh, um, where uh, uh, amplitudes are high, and there's there's all this uh, image aliasing in the Kirchhoff results. Then the Hale dip filter at least doesn't spread those those image aliased errors, you know, all through the section. But there's certainly going to be a band at the top. Um, which is going to give nonsense after the Hale dip filter. It's going to spread it around a bit. Okay, what? Uh, uh, so Lumley is not addressing here the uh, uh, with this paper really the image aliasing, which is a cosmetic issue, or the uh, or the data aliasing, which is a fundamental issue uh, for which there is no solution other than to re-record the data, and of course that's you know. <laughs> That's, that gets done from time to time for important uh, areas. Uh, what he's addressing is operator aliasing. Okay? Now, the, uh, um, the operator, uh, in the terms that, um, uh, that uh, uh, I'm thinking of here, uh, is really related to these uh, ellipsoids of revolution that have their foci at the... Um, uh, at the source and receiver, okay. So that's a uh, that's a migration operator, right? And you you take one time and you get an ellipsoid of revolution, uh, and it's an ellipsoid because, of course, with velocity variation, the ellipse gets stretched in certain directions, especially downward. Um, and uh, so so think of that that ellipsoid as the operator, okay. So the um, the operator that operator has a, a dip. You know the ellipsoids have a dip, and um, the uh, migration uh, summary trajectory is too steep for a given seismic trace spacing and frequency content. Okay, or you could say that the the uh, the frequency content is too high for the seismic trace spacing and the steepness of the operator. Okay, um, and this spatial aliasing occurs throughout uh, our operators, and and uh, you know even um, even even though I built the the anti aliasing control into all of my um, um, all of my main uh, Kirchhoff migrations, um, I, I very rarely you know. Exercise it and and allow the anti-aliasing to completely squash all of the you know all of the high frequencies. Okay, so usually I'm I'm not quite fully imp I'm, I'm I'm implementing you know anti-aliasing control on the most egregiously high frequencies and the most egregiously high dips, but I'm I'm not implementing it on all of the frequencies necessary and and for all the dips necessary. So um, uh, this is a uh, uh, you know it's still a problem, 
uh, but at least we have some sort of flexible control over it. We can calculate an image that has absolutely no um, um, anti-alias, uh, no no spatial alias operator aliasing, and then uh, uh, you know we can gradually cut the the uh, the aliasing control back and uh, see what comes in. And sometimes, you know, the, um, the things we want to see and that we're trying to see will come in just a little bit before uh, all the artifact, the operator aliasing artifacts overwhelm them. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, in a... Um, um, and, 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 you know, if we were, if we were migrating in the uh, FK domain instead of the Kirchhoff, uh, using the Kirchhoff method, then there'd be no question, there's no way that uh, um, you, you, you can't go beyond aliasing in the, uh, in the FK domain, right? So we would not have this problem with FK migrations. Um, and also, uh, if we're migrating like we did uh, in uh, the, the WMIG program in 706, in the fx domain, right? It was a finite difference uh, uh, calculation, uh, uh, finite difference migration that uh, was still in the frequency domain, and and you know, of course, there you can easily modify uh, the frequencies that you incorporate to suppress spatial aliasing of the operator. So the the operator aliasing is is really a prominent problem with this uh, space and time domain. Uh, Kirchhoff uh, uh, migration. All right. Now there had been previous attempts, uh, for instance, uh, by Oz Yumas to, um, um, you know, uh, uh, basically interpolate and duplicate traces. Okay, um, which seems, uh, you know, seems pretty crude. You know, the fact is that you, uh, I mean. Duplicating traces and in interpolation never works with with uh, data uh, spatial aliasing, um, and you could make it work for uh, um, for um, um, for operator uh, alias uh, avoidance, but you know your interpolation is always subtracting information. There's no way to add information, so when you you do something like interpret Interpolation. What you're actually doing is you're subtracting information from your uh, um, from your procedure. Now, you know that it might work very well, um, and, uh, uh, and and Lumley here back in '94 he says, well, you know, it's it's uh, giving you uh, 50 times as much data or a thousand times as much data that you have to 3D migrate. And, you know, these days that that's not uh, not such a bad thing, you know. Um, you know, there we're 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 doing the uh, uh, the surveys now that have uh, you know the one or a few meters spacing over huge districts in three D, um, and uh, of course uh, the reason is that we want to avoid uh, <coughs> spatial aliasing in the data. Um, but uh, uh, you know, so we're 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 used to processing now these uh, enormous data volumes, uh, and so for older surveys where uh, where spatial aliasing is or, or operator aliasing, uh, you know, is more of a problem than with the modern surveys with the very small delta x's, um, you know, maybe it's not a bad idea. You know, maybe uh, maybe the hail. Uh, I mean the uh, uh, the Yilmaz uh, interpolation, uh, you know, could come back into vogue. Um, let's see. Um, now, uh, um, you can also uh, uh, you can also do uh, uh, you know low pass filtering of the input trace data, and. Uh, uh, you know, Gray had proposed kind of a, a very efficient but sort of kludgy way of uh, of doing that, where you pre-filter the data. Okay, 
Now, uh, Lumley's method here is um, um, is a big improvement over that um, because uh, uh, the um, um, uh, you know he's he's solving the anti-aliasing problem the same way you know he's going to perform uh, um, low-pass filtering of the data okay but he's going to um, um, he's going to implement it um, you know differently there's there's going to be a different or at least potentially a different low pass filter applied uh, you know for every different point in the migrated section yet it's it's not ter it's not, it's not really that inefficient okay um, so uh, the uh, um, uh, the anti-aliasing uh, does not add too much to the uh, to the cost of the migration, um, and uh, you know I was able to uh, uh, you know my in my implementation I was able to uh, you know sequester uh, uh, different calculations different parts of the calculation into different parts of the loops, um, so. Uh, there really uh, is is absolutely minimum calculation done on the innermost loop, over uh, which is over uh, depth. So the innermost loop in my migrations is is over depth. Then uh, next out is uh, over uh, uh, the uh, the uh, x and y. Uh, you know the uh, of the migrated volume, the the location of the migrated of the migration point. And uh, and then the outermost loop is over is over the trace, which means over the source and receivers. Um, and uh, uh, it's possible to uh, to keep almost all of the anti-aliasing calculations uh, um, uh, to the uh, um, uh, out of the innermost loop, and uh, they're actually uh, in the loop of uh, the uh, you know where is the epicenter? What's the the x and y coordinate of the uh, um, of the reflecting point? But it doesn't have to be inside the depth loop. Uh, of course, uh, you know deep inside the depth loop, there's the local triangle filtering. Uh, but the um, uh, if you remember, uh, Kirchhoff migration requires a cross correlation of a source wavelet uh, against a uh, um, Against the data anyway, and so that's deep down inside the loop, and that's really the operation that that makes uh, at least my Kirchhoff migrations uh, take the time that they do. Um, okay. Hey John, uh, why would the trace interpolation remove data? Well, um, uh, well, you can't. You well. It's it's adding data, but my 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 proposition is is that it's it it can't add information. Right. So uh, uh, and most interpolations are based on some kind of model, and you're fitting a model like a linear interpolation or a spline interpolation. Okay, you're fitting that model to the the data, and so you're only you know those interpolated traces are um, um, are are fitting a very specific model, and you're adding them, and, and therefore increasing. You know the weight of your result is going to depend more. You know, let's say you have ten times as many interpolated traces as you have original traces. So your original your 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 result now is going to be entirely dependent on the. Um, um, uh, you know, ninety percent dependent on those interpolated traces, but those interpolated traces are derived not because you you interpolated them on the basis of uh, a slant stack and an NMO stack and a, mi and a migration stack. Okay, those would all be ways of interpolating traces, right? Um, uh, you're going to use just one, so you basically, uh, you know. Use one percent of your of your data, one percent of the variation in your data, to uh, um, 
to to make ninety percent of what goes into your uh, what goes into your result. So I say you're you're uh, you're you're actually losing information there. Um, you know, a local interpolation. Uh, you know, you could probably argue. I was thinking like trace to trace, like doubling traces. Probably wouldn't. Again, a very simple model, right? Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, if you if you interpolated traces based on all of the 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 models that we could come up with, right? Mm -hmm. The doubling, the 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 linear, the 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 uh, um, the diffraction, the uh, the NMO. Um, uh, I mean, there's many others we can come up with. If you really interpolated using all those models at once, I think you'd come back closer to to not losing information. But okay. I mean, when do we ever do that? <laughs> And then, if you um, if you're interpolating data um, using um, using uh, forward modeling, then you're dependent on your velocity model, which is an interpretation that only uses some of the data. So, uh, you know, even if you use physics, you're kind of uh, you're kind of hung because yeah. you're so model dependent. I was thinking just like trace to trace. Right, right. Now that's the same. I think that would turn out to be the same thing as interpolating traces using a slant stack. Okay. Um, I got you. I was just wondering what. I got you. Yeah. Well, that's a pretty strong statement. You know, by adding traces, you're removing information. <laughs> yeah, you're just kind of like you said. I mean, if you interpolated a thousand traces between each trace, what are you really migrating? Right, right. So you're kind of weighing the you can't you can't go back and weigh down those thousand interpolated traces by, yeah. you know, by point one, or point one percent, right? Because then you're back to having aliasing. So, yeah. I gotcha. yeah. All right. Um. Okay, so let's uh, let's get this equation corrected here. Um, the uh, 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 let's see. Erase this one. This is two delta t, okay, and um, uh, you know that's that's a capital T. That's fine. Um, all right. So the uh, the operator trajectory has to satisfy the dip Nyquist sampling criteria. All right. So the the delta t is the move out time along the migration operator between uh, uh, adjacent traces. Okay, so we're, we, what we're really doing here is we're we're just um, you know calculating the the slope of the um, of the uh, migration operator of the of the Kir Kirchhoff operator, and and um, so you just take uh, one over two times that slope. Two times delta t, and that's your uh, that's your f max. Okay, so the f max has to be less than or equal to one over two delta t. All right, and here's uh, the definition of delta t. Very useful. As you think about this, one over two uh, divided by uh, uh, dtk over d rho uh, divided by delta rho. Okay, what are those things? Um, dtk d rho is the local spatial derivative of the migration operator at the point of intersection with the seismic trace. Okay, um, And uh, uh, delta rho is the seismic trace spacing along the recording surface. So the, the thing to note here is that um, Lumley is, is assuming that all the sources and all the receivers are, at, are, are on a flat surface. Okay, And um, uh, so, so you know, Lumley's theory is not precisely applicable to my migrations of, of earthquakes, um, uh, and I think what I what that gets me is you know by having um, 
by a, so maybe that's some justification actually, now that I think about it, maybe that's some justification for my, my use of Lumley's anti-aliasing criteria lightly, right? Um, as is the case for the recent Nobel Prize in physics, uh, or is it chemistry, for the fluorescence imaging, when you have, when you have sources of waves close to your um, um, close to your image, close to your target, that's when you can get past the um, that's when you can get past um, the uh, uh, the limitations of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. That's the way it looks. I mean, really, it's not, but that's the way it looks. Okay, and the limitations of uh, of only being able to resolve, you know, things that are greater than one wavelength apart, or beyond the Fresnel zone anyway. You know, if you define if you define the Fresnel zone as uh, the Fresnel radius as a quarter wavelength, and you think you can see that, okay, fine. But um, you know, the fluorescence imaging gets way better than that. Um, and the um, uh, and perhaps having having earthquake sources of waves down you know close to the structures I'm trying to image that also uh, enables me to look at um, um, to look at steeper dips at higher frequencies than uh, than I thought I could. Uh, on the other hand, the depths that I have for those earthquakes are really poorly known. So uh, I I could I could be just fooling myself, you know that uh, that I'm getting any you know that I I you know maybe combine the uh, depth error with the um, um, uh, you know if I actually consider the depth error and its effect on the anti-aliasing criteria, I should apply something even more strict than Lumley's uh, um, anti-aliasing. So. Um, you know, I've chosen to use it, but uh, it is a little bit tricky for uh, buried sources. Uh, okay, so the local spatial derivative of the migration operator at the point of intersection with the seismic trace, delta rho is the seismic trace spacing along the recording surface, and he uses rho here because uh, you know he doesn't uh, yet. He wants to make this general. You know, this is the rho. Is in the spacing is in any direction, right? So it's it's kind of a you know rho is like a radius, okay. Um, so uh, what this suggests then is this simple method of of low pass filtering the uh, the seismic trace so that uh, you stay below f max, okay. Um, and again, uh, local triangle filters are the way. That Lumley and I uh, both do it. Okay. So uh, for the special case of Kirchhoff time migration, all right. You know we we have very little information available to us, but the, the really powerful information that we do have are the source time and the receiver time. Okay. So uh, first, uh, uh, he's going to give us a. Uh, a uh, analytic expression of the uh, pre-stack time migration uh, operator, and uh, then he's going to show us the anti-alias criterion for that. And then he's going to comment on the on the pre-stack depth migration operator for Kirchhoff. Now, as you know, um, you know well Kirchhoff migration in three D and whatever it's still a migration, so it has a downward continuation. It has a, an imaging. Uh, uh, an imaging condition, okay, and here's the you know here's the old familiar imaging condition, right? The uh, the Kirchhoff time, okay. <clears throat> um, the uh, uh, the total two way Kirchhoff migration reflection travel time, right, is the time from the source to the reflector plus the time from the reflector to the receiver, okay. And and you know this is just writing down here the um, um, uh, the the, the uh, hypotenuses of those uh, of those triangles, okay, for T S and T R, okay. So what we've got here is uh, 
rho s. That's the distance of the epicenter of the source. Okay, or if we're if all of our sources and receivers are on a plane, rho s is the distance from the source to the epicenter of the uh, of the uh, uh, of the reflecting point. Okay, so that's the horizontal distance, if you like, between the uh, the reflecting point and the uh, <coughs> and the uh, uh, and the source. Uh, of course, then divided by v squared. You know, so that gives you one leg of the triangle. And tau squared is the two way is the one way vertical travel time, so that's the other leg of the triangle. Okay, uh, this this time triangle. And then for the receiver, right, rho sub r is um, the uh, horizontal distance uh, in any direction, but the horizontal distance from the uh, um, um, from the epicenter of the reflector, uh, you know, at the surface, uh, the point above the reflector on the surface. Um, to the receiver, okay, and the same, you know, the 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 we're only talking about one reflecting point here, so that's the same tau squared, okay. Um, and the uh, uh, <coughs> um, these links are, uh, you know, you can calculate with this uh, equation, <coughs> and uh, this is actually the. Uh, the equation that I that I had wrong, dead wrong in my um, in my code that I had to fix. Um, that was the big thing I had to fix after I uh, recoded, uh, redid the uh, the AARGK MIG program. Um, so uh, let's see. Um, so here's you know here's exactly where we're assuming that the the recording surface is a horizontal plane at constant some constant datum depth z naught, <clears throat> um, and uh, I don't know a little bit this this star here is kind of a, it's just a dummy variable so that's it's either source or receiver that's fine um, maybe a little bit unorthodox to use a star <clears throat> and then uh, you need the spatial derivative. Of uh, this time equation to uh, define uh, the aliasing criterion. Okay, so uh, that's uh, d t k d rho. That's what you need. Okay, right in the in the equation to calculate the uh, where was that <clears throat> the equation to calculate the frequency. Yeah, there it is. Right, <clears throat> delta rho up here in equation one. That's the a a d x. In my codes, okay. DTK D rho. That's what we got to calculate, okay. So uh, um, DTK D rho boils down to uh, pretty close to um, this uh, uh, surface uh, surface distance for uh, the surface distance for um, the uh, uh, the source. Source to uh, reflection epicenter uh, surface distance rho sub s divided by the t sub s uh, plus the surface distance from the uh, reflection reflector epicenter to the receiver divided by uh, that's uh, rho sub r divided by t sub r. And if you look at my code, you'll see uh, you'll see rho s, rho r variables like that. Um, and uh, you know where are we getting the times? Well, we have the times because we're my, we're doing a Kirchhoff migration. We get we had to calculate those all already. Okay. All right. The effective RMS spatial sample. So then he gives a spatial sampling interval. Okay, an effective RMS spatial sampling interval by um, this is a, just a geometric average, right? A geometric mean here. Um, so we have dx sub s, we have dy sub s, we have dx sub r, we have dy sub r. Those are the spatial samplings in the x and y directions across the planar recording surface, right? We calculated all those, and um, and that uh, uh, taking their geometric mean here, which is all this is, it's not a it's not a Pythagorean theorem, uh, gives us delta rho. Okay, that should be delta rho there, and it got. Uh, the text got recognized as AP. Oh well. Um, 
and then uh, here's the uh, the dx and dy, which could be dxs or d or dxr and dys or dyr. Okay, so uh, there they are, um, and the uh, there's row r and row s, right? This is row star. That's row star, and those are row r, row r and row s. At least uh, you know when I was when I was working on my codes, I had the paper copy um, of the uh, of the paper, and not uh, I didn't have to uh, you know retranslate uh, uh, from the PDF here with all of its errors. Okay, so here's the uh, the anti-aliasing uh, criterion now that we can use. We have uh, delta rho, which is the nominal. Sp uh, trace space uh, nominal spacing, um, which is um, um, the uh, uh, you know there's the velocity at the uh, reflecting point. Um, there's uh, the uh, 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 the trace spacing delta rho. Okay, there's our rho s and rho r, our our times t s and t r. Okay. Just uh, uh, put on the uh, denominator there, <clears throat> and that all gives us our uh, our maximum uh, our maximum frequency. Okay, now for depth migration, uh, of course, uh, you know we have to uh, um, uh, you know we, we have to uh, apply a, an RMS velocity field. Okay, this is one one way of estimating that. Uh, of course, we do have um, velocity in x, y, and z. Okay, so uh, uh, I only apply the uh, RMS velocity when I'm doing time migration. Okay, I mean I'm doing time migration in depth, so you know I still need to use a velocity, and I and I do calculate and use the RMS velocity. How do I calculate the RMS velocity for time migration? I use the um, uh, I use the one-dimensional uh, velocity fields, uh, um, the the travel time vertically below the the, the source in my in my uh, one-dimensional um, in my one-dimensional uh, um, uh, in, in my in my uh, uh, depth versus uh, versus uh, epicentral distance. Uh, uh, time section. Okay, so uh, I, I derive the uh, RMS velocity from that, um, and uh, uh, of course we have uh, good velocities um, in uh, in three D maybe certainly in two D, and so that's actually what I use for uh, um, calculating these operators. Uh, um, and I and I. Uh, um, uh, you can do this. Uh, uh, I, I don't get as accurate as 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 this uh, second uh, procedure that he suggests here, which is differencing the source and receiver travel times at the trace location uh, with respect to an adjacent uh, source and receiver location. Um, uh, so that uh, uh, that's something uh, that I could do to uh, make the anti-aliasing a bit more accurate. Um, <clears throat> let's see. So RMS velocity field, that's a two-dimensional field? That's a, uh, yeah, it's a, well, no, it's, it's, uh, one, it's one-dimensional, you know, because I, I only use that for time migration, and I do, uh, you know, that's the, uh, the lat mig or, uh, or C mig. Um, <clears throat> that's where I only have a one-dimensional velocity function. That's lat mig, and then AA, K mig uses. That's only in 2D, and that's where we have you know good velocity at every point. Okay. That's what I meant though. So, so AAR, the, the one we're going to use is this bottom paragraph, the second picture. The. Uh, uh, this first the middle one, and then you stretch it. Uh, I actually use neither. Um, I use. Uh, um, Let's see. 
uh, I really use uh, this uh, this equation directly. So the dt k d rho is not exactly uh, <coughs> is is not exactly uh, uh, you know is it is an approximation, especially across those you know those really big lateral velocity boundaries. Um, so you do that, and then you just put the end of your triangle at that frequency, so it tapers to zero when you get there. Is that what you're yeah, yeah. Let's uh, let's uh, let's look at at uh, this uh, next section here on the anti-alias filter design. Okay. Now, um, uh, you know, Lumley proposes a very nice, uh, you know, these these uh, these triangle filters. Okay. And I um, I do something that's simpler, and um, uh, probably um, um, uh, probably uh, is actually more of a low pass filter. Even instead of using triangles, I use uh, box cars. Okay, so if you think about it, what I what I'm doing is I'm assuming that the time derivative of my um, of my source is a is a box car, okay. Now that's a that's a pretty broad approximation there, right? Because I'm going to correlate the uh, the source with a in the process of Kirchhoff migration, right? As we found out, you know, through Lebrasse's theory, right? We got to cross correlate between our data and a uh, and the time derivative of the source. And what I'm doing is where I need to do anti-alias low-pass filtering, I'm just making that box car longer. So I'm effectively taking a lower frequency source wavelet and doing the cross correlation. All right, and uh, and then I'm assuming that the time derivative is a is a box car. Okay, so that's uh, uh, you know that's got a uh, uh, a particular. Uh, that has a particular effect, okay. Um, but it's uh, you know it does make it very simple, and it does uh, you know when you cross correlate uh, with a short box car, you don't do very much uh, um, low pass filtering, and when you cross correlate with a very long box car, um, you're doing a lot of uh, low pass uh, of low cut filter, a low pass filtering, a lot of low pass filtering. All right, so. According to uh, Ronan's theory, that's what I'm, that's what I'm doing. Um, you know, Lumley here is using a triangle um, function, and so uh, he's assuming that the triangle is the uh, time derivative of um, of the source wavelet. And so, if you integrate a triangle, what do you get? Um, you get a uh, oh you get a um, you get a, a, a Gaussian, don't you? So he's assuming the the source wavelet is a Gaussian. You get an infinite number of times. Yeah, so you just get a, you get a you integrate the. Uh, it converges to a Gaussian. Yeah, yeah. Right. How, how, why are we saying low pass for a box car? Isn't that a band pass? Uh, Same with the triangle. Well, what we're doing is uh, is is an integration. We're adding up. Okay, that cross correlation is effectively a, an integration. Okay, it's the same thing as the. Um, uh, well, well, okay, okay. Think of it this way. The box car is in the time domain. Right. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Everything here is in the time domain. Okay. okay. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, actually, the simplest boxcar frequency domain filter is uh, is a low pass, <laughs> also. But that's that's totally beside the point. <laughs> that's irrelevant. Um, well, it has to do with where the boxcar is centered, right? Yeah, yeah. But but we're talking about a time domain boxcar. Yeah. Okay. Now, no, notice that a a triangle and a boxcar. Are are symmetric. If you flip them over, they're the same thing. Okay, maybe with a delay, right? But um, 
or flip them back to front, right? So uh, um, um, we're not just we're not just uh, uh, we're not just cross correlating with a box car or a triangle. We're also convolving with a box car or a triangle, right? That's the only difference between time domain convolution and, and cross correlation is the the time flip, right? But for the box car and the uh, and the triangle doesn't matter. So we're also convolving with a box car, and maybe you remember that convolving with a box car is an integration. It's a low-pass filter. So uh, uh, you know that's what. Uh, um, and then the length is is determined by this uh, this frequency. Uh, the length of the box car is determined by this frequency criter criterion. So you know, I calculate the uh, um, I calculate the uh, the frequency criterion um, separately <clears throat> at every migrated point for every every individual trace. Okay, uh, <clears throat> and then when I want to go and and uh, okay, and then this is the uh, this is the downward continuation. Call it sideways, you know. Call it ray continuation if you like. Um, I want to go and get an amplitude from the seismic trace, but first, according to Labrasse's theory, I've got to, um, I've got to, uh, uh, I've got to uh, cross correlate my data against the uh, the source wavelength. And and before I implemented the anti-aliasing criterion. I would cross correlate the source wavelet first. I'd bring the trace in. I cross correlate with the source wavelet, and uh, and then I would just pluck that value at the uh, at the uh, imaging conditions time. Okay, and I would add that into the migrated section. Okay, now um, I, I I leave the trace alone after I bring it in, and uh, I apply a summation. Over a box car, which is uh, which is the length required to avoid uh, the length given according to the anti-aliasing criteria. Okay, so I'm I'm uh, you know at every different trace at every different reflecting point, um, I'm getting a, a time according to the imaging condition, you know TS plus TR, and um, and I go to that time, and then I Causally correlate what comes in at that time and later. So I don't, I don't, uh, uh, um, because a lot of my data is uh, is uh, minimum phase. You know, like the earthquake data and explosion data is minimum phase. Um, I haven't thought about uh, um, you know the fact that I'm correlating quite often also. Um, uh, you know, a causal um, vibrator uh, correlated vibrator data. You know, so there's a there's another possible modification. You know, maybe I should shift my box car to be to be uh, centered on the uh, on the uh, um, on the imaging condition to be centered on the on the TR plus TS the T sub K as uh, Lumley puts it uh, for vibrator data. So that's a that's a possible modification. Um, this was also inspired by um, imaging experiments conducted by um, oh can, I've forgotten his name right now uh, I'll have to insert it into the video later um, a colleague of mine over at the uh, USGS in Menlo Park who uh, you know he's a he's a he's he's a very uh, interesting thinker um, and. Uh, you know, he recognized uh, right away uh, uh, the uses of, of uh, Labrasse's uh, cross correlation. You know, it's matched filtering, which you can use to deconvolve the. Um, um, uh, you can deconvolve out the uh, very complex uh, uh, source time function of an earthquake. So. Uh, um, you know, I was I was actually using uh, very large, uh, especially with earthquake data. I was using very large uh, ends. You know, there's this uh, you know endpoint here, anti-alias triangle filter, 
and I'm using endpoint uh, anti-alias boxcar filters. Okay, um, and and there are uh, there are very large. Um, if you use very large n, you can actually uh, uh, match filter your way out of out of very complex uh, earthquake uh, source time functions. Uh, and I was also since I was also migrating uh, earthquake data, um, I was inspired by that. Um, I'll think of his name when it's too late. Um, so uh, uh, you know this uh, uh, the box cars that we use here uh, for anti-alias criteria, like for your uh, Santa, you know for a standard survey like your Santa Medio surveys. The box cars are not that long, you know. I was, I was, as I was debugging my code, I was uh, looking at at box car lengths of, um, you know, sixteen points, thirty two points, that sort of thing, time points. Um, so it's not a very strong, uh, um, not a very strong low pass filter. Okay, so that's an explanation. Uh, you can look at Lumley's data examples, and. Uh, it's time for us to yield up the room. <laughs>